Welcome to Late Night Writers. On this episode, we talk with Casey Bizet. Casey is the owner and writer for The Natural Healthy Horse, and she also writes for our blog, yourhorsefarm.com. You'll hear about keeping your horses barefoot, supplements, and natural alternatives. So enjoy! Welcome to Late Night Riders. I'm Gretchen, and I'm joined by my mom, Kristen, my grandma, Debbie, and Casey Bazet. Hey, Casey. Hi. Casey, Hi. you are um, the owner of The Naturally Healthy Horse. Can you talk a little bit about your blog and it's um, like what you write about? In 2012, um, I started that particular blog. I had another one before that just for a short amount of time, but um, I've always enjoyed writing like writing, W-R-I-T-I-N-G, yes. um, and also writing, but, um, so I decided I just wanted to do something that had to do with horses, and in particular horse health, and I had just, um, I don't know, I think I had just graduated from my acupressure school around that time, so I decided, like, to focus on natural horse health, um, so, so yeah, so mainly I just cover anything related to natural horse health care. So um, I, my main three focuses are like barefoot um, care. I happen to trim my own horses, so um, that's been kind of like a learning process, and I've written about that. Um, I write about acupressure sometimes. I write a lot about nutrition. Uh, so those are the three main areas, and then I kind of branch off into other areas as well. So, mm-hmm. so can we take it back to the beginning? How did you get started in horses, and how did you get to like where you are now? Well, I I'm 42 years old. So um, when I was a little girl, my mom had horses, and she did trail riding and um, that kind of thing. And um, I guess when I was uh, they got me a pony when I was, you know, little. I wasn't really all that interested um, at first. Didn't really connect with that particular pony. But um, when I was around fourth or fifth grade, I started taking riding lessons. And um, I fell in love with the horse that I took riding lessons on. Her name was Lady. Aww. And mm-hmm. uh, my horses, in- my parents ended up uh, leasing her for me. So um, that was kind of the beginning. I was about, I don't know, 10, 12 years old. And I just, um, I started writing you know just trail writing for fun and then got into horse showing and then in my teenage years um I moved on to another horse but I got into barrel racing and I did that for um a long time anyways I don't do it anymore but um so I was in the competitive world of horses for a long time now I'm more in um just the horse ownership side where I just basically care for my horses um I do ride occasionally now but they're more just like pets and um it's just something I'll always have I'm sure so yeah yeah so my whole life how did you get um started in like the acupressure and um like the more holistic health care so I was barrel racing I don't know up until about 10 12 years ago and my horse at the time Hershey I still have him um he got hurt and um nobody could really figure out what was wrong with him. I kept taking him to different vets and um, nobody could really pinpoint what was wrong with him. Um, so I just started researching, I guess, some like holistic um, methods of care and just some different things and um, became interested in like massage. And then I learned about acupressure. So um, I decided to go to school to learn how to do that. And um, I, I can't say that that, you know, solved all of Hershey's problems, but um, I just became fascinated with um, that whole side of horse care that I really hadn't known much about until then. So, um, so yeah, I just kind of dove in right there, and then I just started writing about it as well. So. How is acupressure different from massage? What's the what would be the biggest differences? I mean, if, to somebody watching, it might look similar. Um, if you, if you know what acupuncture is, it's with the needles. Mm-hmm. Uh, so only a, in most states, I think probably all of the United States, only veterinarians or doctors can do, like, actually use a needle and stick it in. Um, so we use those same points on the body, but we use finger pressure. So basically you're applying pressure with your finger. Sometimes you can use, like, a laser or different, you know, tools. Um, you're applying pressure to those points on the horse's body. Um, Instead of the needle. 
level, but it's, you know, you're basically doing the same thing. So, you know, to somebody watching, it might look like I'm just touching their horse on different <laughs> parts of the body. So it might look a little bit like massage, but massage is more like, you know, working out um, knots and, you know, things in the muscles. And we're um, dealing with something different. You know, it's, it's based in Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine. So um, there's something we call qi, which is like the mm -hmm. life energy flowing through the horse. So we're kind of, um, we're dealing more with that, this kind of non-tangible thing that's hard to explain, but um, more than just the muscles themselves. Although it does, it can help with you know, lots of muscle issues and just a wide variety of things really. So. Do you feel like the um, holistic part of things that you do, does that come from, is that something that's newer? Um, holistic ideas or is it from um, this isn't the right word but like home remedy things that you found or for things from the past that has worked or the combination I think it's something we're just kind of rediscovering um, especially in the western world um, you know, traditional Chinese medicine has been around for thousands of years um, and acupressure and acupuncture has been around for a long long time um, so here it's not as widely Use. I think it's becoming more popular, and um, I've noticed a big, you know, need for, you know, a lot of people are interested in that sort of thing, and I've just, I found a lot of people um, are really interested in the topics that I write about in my blog, so there's definitely an interest in it. Um, I think a lot of people have found things, you know, for themselves that have worked, but I think we're just kind of rediscovering um, a lot of these old um, methods that have just now kind of been brought back to the surface. So. I've noticed that too on our blog when you write for us and you uh, one of the examples was like natural remedies for butte. That blog oh, post yeah. mm -hmm. went crazy compared to our other ones and so like there's definitely people looking to find natural alternatives. Yeah, yeah. and I think yeah I think a lot of people um, you know and I'm not so natural that I would never use like butte or I would never use um, you know certain drugs that the vet would give me like you know I do use those things but when I can I try to substitute um, some of these other things so I just think a lot of people are interested in that these days so mm -hmm. yeah, agreed. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, from what you said like your vet you tried to find help for your horse and um, I think you know from that standpoint it's hard sometimes you can't you know your vets are so good but then sometimes there are other alternatives, and for you to be able to go out and find that, I think is really wonderful and be able to tell people about it because um, obviously then your horse had gotten better. I'm taking it from the things that you uh, did with him. Actually, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> he, okay. Not, no. He's 26 now. Uh -huh. um, I had to retire him basically at 14. Okay. So, yeah, that's what I was saying. Acupressure didn't solve anything for him. Um, I... I've worked on other horses, you know, and been able to help them. But um, uh, Hershey, I don't know. I mean, it's something, it's a strange lameness. So it's either okay. something in his neck or his back, hmm. you know, it could okay. possibly be kissing spines. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. But no, it, you know, it's it's not a cure-all. And I, I know a lot of people, I get questions all the time, like, you know, what herb can I use to fix this problem or what? Right. Um, holistic remedies or whatever you want to call them like they're not a cure-all and I mm -hmm. tell people that you know it's just like part of you've got to kind of pull from different areas you know you might use this sure from your vet. you might use this that you've found um but yeah there's never like a easy fix for a lot of these things that happen mm -hmm. with our horses so, yes. unfortunately mm -hmm. yeah and especially but, it's hard because yeah. we can't ask them they can't yeah <laughs> can't get the feedback unless you see it so yeah yeah do you feel like there's something that gives you feedback to know whether to start with your process like the acupressure or health, like the natural things, or you know that you need to call the vet? Um, yeah, I mean, with acupressure, I'll start there. Like, the horses actually do give feedback um, in the way. It's really just a subtle body language that you have to learn to read. Um, but a lot of times when I'm doing acupressure, the horses, they'll get very relaxed. Um, and when I hold a specific point for a while, like they will lick and chew. Um, there's other things we call it like a release, but we'll notice certain mm -hmm. things and then we mm -hmm. realize, okay, it's time to move on to the next um, point. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens with massage and with some other like modalities as well. But 
Um, it's just really a matter of like reading their the subtle body language. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> like, is there a time when you just know it's time to call the vet as opposed to using something that so, it would be natural? So, yeah, so let's just take, like, colic, for instance. Um, colic is something that, I mean, a lot of people have experienced with their horses, and it's something that could be very serious. I've had a horse that had colic surgery. Mm. Um, so if it's a minor colic, I... You know, I mean, I can, you can tell a lot of times if there's, if they're just like not eating, you can tell they just, or if something's not quite right, I will start with acupressure. Um, I might use like a homeopathic remedy if I have that on hand. Um, you know, just some walking them, of course, the standard things you would do for colic. Um, but, you know, again, if they're laying down, um, if they're attempting to roll, I'm going to call my vet right mm-hmm. away. So I'm not going to mess around with something like that. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, it just, it kind of just depends on what it is and how serious it is. Um, a lot of the holistic treatments work, they're more of a preventative or they can work on, you know, chronic conditions, you know, something that's mm-hmm. acute, like colic that's happening right now, like that needs to be treated right now. You know, that's when, um, vets and Western medicine is, is, um, you know, that's when that comes into play. Yeah, kind of like taking vitamins to be preventative and needing antibiotics for something that's serious. Right, Right. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're going to go to the hospital if, you know, if Mm -hmm. we're bleeding badly or something, you know, we're not going to take an herb. So Okay. So So can you talk a little bit about um, you're starting to trim your own horse's feet um, and you're a big proponent of going barefoot. Can you talk about the benefits of that? So yeah, I've started trimming. My husband is um, a trained farrier. He went to farrier school. Um, so when we started dating, like even, um, he would trim or shoe my horses. So pretty much all, you know, throughout, once we got married, like he was kind of in charge of my horse's feet, unless I needed like, um, sometimes I would need like special shoes or something that I would recommend and I would have somebody else come in. Um, but yeah, I guess when I was at acupressure school, I met, um, a lady who was a barefoot trimmer and it was just really fascinating to me like talking to her because number one she was a woman and I just thought wow like I didn't think most women were like strong enough physically to actually trim their horse's feet I just I didn't know mm-hmm. um, but number two I was just really like interested in the whole barefoot thing I, like I wanted to know more about it and that's actually like Hershey the horse I was talking about earlier that got hurt he had really bad feet Hmm. and had cracks and stuff and so like I just um I guess I was just interested for him mainly so um I learned how to trim I'm basically self-taught like my husband kind of would give me tips I just did a lot of research Mm -hmm. Pete Ramey is a guy that um does clinic he has a book um so I read his book and just like really did a lot of research and I just took it really slow and I would kind of have my husband watch me because I was afraid of doing something wrong. But, um, right. Probably been, I don't know, been nine, ten years ago that I started that. And, and I've, just, I've just kept up with it. Because to me, um, it's easier for me to do it because I know when my horse needs to be done. Mm-hmm. Be trapped and I go out and do it. Um, whereas, you know, before I was having to wait on my husband and his schedule and everything. Um so since I don't ride my horses a whole lot, like I have Hershey who's retired. Mm-hmm. I have another mare who's pretty much retired. She um, was entered probably 10, 15 years ago. And then I have a younger horse that I do ride sometimes, but um, they're basically what I call pasture pets. So mm-hmm. uh, for them being barefoot is kind of like a no brainer because why would I want to keep shoes on them if I'm not doing a whole lot? Uh, but as I've written about barefoot and like met more people, I've just, I've learned about all these people who do like endurance and um, all kinds of different, uh, you know, sports and with barefoot horses. And mm-hmm. I've just been uh, amazed at how, you know, horses can do this barefoot. And so um, what I've learned though, mainly about barefoot is that once you take that shoe off, the hoof really became, becomes um, completely different because mm-hmm. It's able to, it's making contact with the ground. It's able to expand and to contract with their movement, which mm-hmm. is, you know, the natural way that 
horse's hoof is going to move anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, As long as you keep up with the trimming, you can't let them overgrow. And it has to be done a certain way, you know. They've Mm got to be trimmed. Uh, Their heels have to be somewhat low. The toes have to be kept somewhat short. So, um, and I've just, I've seen a lot of people who have been really successful with it, even with their, you know, competitive and Hmm. endurance trail riding horses, so just something that um, I've just been really interested in learning more about over the years. So, Have you worked with horses that um, are driving horses too at all or researched that a lot to know, um, you know, horses that maybe pole or that type of thing, you know, um, do they, can they go barefoot as well? Driving horses? Like, like if you are, you know, have horses that you drive instead of riding and that type of thing. Maybe you're not necessarily road driving, but um, maybe more so like on, um, oh, I don't know, I, w- I want to say maybe road or to the side of the road or that type of thing. Can they go barefoot too? They can't. What I've learned is that pretty much any horse can go barefoot, um, but it takes work. And um, there's several things that kind of have to be in place. Like, number one, their diet has to be right, like the right minerals, um, mm. zinc and copper are two minerals that a lot of horses are deficient in. I've, I've taken nutrition courses, so I've, I've learned this. Um, uh, so if the diet's not right, if they have too much sugar in the diet, even too much grass, because there's sugar in the grass, it can mm-hmm. make their feet tender. Mm. Um, so that, um, and of course that you know, leads to laminitis, like uh, eating too much grass at once, of course. Um, but yeah, you've got to have the diet right the horse's environment so like if a horse is kept in a really soft um you know wet pasture Mm -hmm. you take them out onto a dry gravel road they're going to be ouchy Um, Uh so what a lot of people are doing is making these track systems around their pasture Mm -hmm. um i don't know if you've heard of that but and then they'll put gravel or just some different types of footing yes Mm -hmm. and to basically toughen up their horse's feet so if, if uh, if you can get the home environment somewhat like the riding environment, the horses can actually, their feet will adapt nice. and can toughen up and they can do that. So We've heard them called uh, so yeah. paradise paddocks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah same mm-hmm. thing. Okay. Yeah. So, yep. yeah. Okay. So that's one thing. And, you know, the horses that live in the desert um, in these dry, arid environments, like they don't have near the issues. Um mm-hmm that some of our horses, like in Oklahoma, we've got just tons and tons of grass. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, my horse's feet are softer, but I've noticed when we have like a period of drought, so, you know, their feet, of course, will toughen up and, mm-hmm. and dry out. Um, so, yeah, it's just, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but, but yeah, it can work, I think, for any horse. So, Do, um, if horses have a tendency to have cracking hoofs, Can that be due to diet um, or weather or too dry? Or is there anything that maybe might be a tip that people could do if they get, like, you know, cracks in their hoofs? Yeah. um, I would, number one, yeah, I would look at diet. Um, Okay. There's a lot of trace minerals that are deficient. And um, if if you feed a complete feed and you're feeding it at the recommended amount, like most of those feeds are going to contain the right amounts, but uh, most people don't feed at the recommended amount. So, um, like if you have a bag to feed, you, most people aren't going to feed, you know, whatever it says to feed. They're just feeding enough to kind of keep their horse looking good. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I feel like my horses are on a forage based diet. Like they eat mainly grass. I feed mm-hmm. a little bit of feed, um, with their supplements in it, just as a way to get their supplements into them. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, I have Hershey who needs senior feed because he just mm-hmm. can't keep weight on mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. But, um, but, yeah, diet is definitely a big factor in um, okay. the health of the hoof. So um, I would take a look at those trace minerals and see if your horse is getting enough of them. Um, protein can also be a factor um, if your horse, especially older horses that aren't absorbed. Like, usually horses get enough protein and grass and hay and everything, but older horses aren't absorbing it. I've mm-hmm. learned, um, so like Hershey, I've added like a lysine, um, which is a type of protein supplement, and I've seen a difference in, in his feet just by adding that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I bet weather can affect it as well. So, you know, and then if you're not trimming, you know, whatever your horse 
Yeah, it kind of depends on the environment. Some horses need to be trimmed like every four weeks. Some can go six or eight weeks. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not trimming frequently enough and that toe is overgrowing, then of course the pressure put on that is going right. to lead mm -hmm. it to cracks. So. Right. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, diet's probably the biggest part though. Okay. okay. Are your horses here barefoot? They are. And how often do they have to get trimmed? Probably about every six to eight weeks. Right around there, yep. Just depends on, you know, when we can schedule it. But, yeah, yeah. we keep them on a pretty good schedule. Yeah. 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 So, um, about every four weeks, but that's just kind of what I found works for me, and it's just, it's different for everyone. So uh -huh. it mm -hmm. depends on what you're doing with them and how much movement they're getting. And, you know, some of them will self-trim uh, if they're moving a lot. And so, yeah, it just, it just depends on your individual mm -hmm. horse. Mm -hmm. If they were to have, like, the Paradise Paddock, would that help keep their feet more trimmed because there's, like, different ground? It could, yeah, because they're, the whole, like, principle behind that is you're keeping the horses moving, so they're moving around that paddock. Um, so, yeah, that definitely can help. And if you have some, if you put in some rocks or gravel or, you know, something in there um, that is going to help self-trim, then yeah, that can definitely reduce the, mm -hmm. or, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It can um, basically bring down the, the time that you need to trim. So mm -hmm. instead of going like every four weeks, you might be able to go every six, A eight weeks. Longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what, like, if people want to get started in holistic, like, practices, where can they start with their horses? Um, I, I would say the internet really, I mean, there's just so much information out there. There's so many blogs and, um, you know, even there's vets that holistic vets that have blogs and write articles and things online. And so I like regularly have different vets, right. Um, for me, or I mean, not necessarily write for me, but they let me share their blogs. Um, sometimes they do write content just for my blog. Um, so, you know, if you, want, if you want to start with a vet who writes, um, Madeline Ward is one, uh, Thomas Teske is another one, um, I'm, it'll, it'll come to me, but yeah, there's yeah. several mm -hmm. who um, do that kind of thing. And then, of course, you have people like me, I write solely on, like, holistic stuff for my particular blog. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of information out there on the internet. Um, talk to friends, you know, who may be doing the same thing. So it's just, yeah, a matter of just sharing that information. What questions do you feel like you get the most often? Um, I, I think I mentioned this earlier. I get a lot of times people want to know, like, what herb they can use to mm -hmm. fix a certain problem, mm -hmm. um, which I can – definitely like recommend herbs that will help but again you have to like you can't just look at it from one angle you have to look at it from a wider angle I guess and there's usually not just one thing that's going to fix a big problem like ulcers for example you know just feeding like slippery elm is an herb that people feed just feeding slippery elm um, and maybe aloe vera juice like that can help but you also need to look at why does that horse have ulcers in the first place? You know, are, yeah. are they going too long without grass or hay? Are they stressed? Um, are they kept in a stall 24 hours a day? You know, like there's other things that go into it that probably need to be changed. So, yeah, I get a lot of questions about nutrition just because I write a lot about that. Um, I also get some barefoot questions, too. So, so yeah, a little bit of everything, <laughs> I'd say. Yeah, and you're certified in the acupressure and in the equine nutrition, is that correct? Yeah. I'm certified in acupressure, and um, as part of that program, I had to take equine nutrition courses. Okay. Where I didn't have to, I had a choice in different, several different courses, but I chose to focus on nutrition. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say I'm certified in it, but I've taken several courses. Um, Dr. Kellen is one who offers um, online courses, so I took several of hers. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I, I feel like I know enough to like be able to recommend things, but I'm definitely not, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not like certified in it. So. Right. Well, awesome. So what's next for you and what's next for your blog? Um, well, I, um, my blog, you know, has been
been going for a while now, since I think 2012, and I was writing like weekly for it for a long time, and just this past December, I announced that I was going to kind of cut back a little bit on writing for it, so I'm only doing like one post a month, maybe two some months um, right now, and that's mainly so I can focus on um, my freelance writing, like I write for you guys and Mm -hmm. some other blogs, and I write for some publications and things like that, so I'm kind of trying to focus on that. And I'm also focusing on, um, I write fiction as well for young adults. So um, I'm trying to really focus on that as well. So um, and I I was a teacher in my former life. I taught for 10 years. So I do still, like I sub a little bit Mm -hmm. in school. I'm kind of doing a little bit of everything right now. Mm -hmm. But um, I kind of feel like I, for my blog in particular, I've kind of written about everything that I know to write about. (laughs) Like sometimes it's a little hard to come up with new content and um, but but you know I, I can do it and so and you know I'm still gonna write for it and um I'm definitely not gonna quit anytime soon so just yeah. just have it you know kind of moving in a new direction I guess you could say so mm-hmm. yeah we love having you write for us uh-huh. they're always really interesting blogs mm-hmm. and you can find her blogs at yourhorsefarm.com All right, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll enter our next segment, Canter Banter. Do you love horses and live the equestrian lifestyle? Be sure to check out our brand new blog at www.yourhorsefarm.com. We publish three posts per week and feature a free printable equine checklist every month. Yourhorsefarm.com is a great equine online resource, so be sure to share with all the horse lovers in your life. And remember, laugh much and ride often. Our next segment, Canter Banter, is brought to you by Ram Horse Fencing and Stalls, the one-stop shop for your horse farm. Ram is family-owned and operated and has been in business for over 30 years. We welcome you to call in and speak with an expert about your next project today at 866-653-8984. Again, that's 866-653-8984. And we're back. (laughs) On this segment of Canter Banter, we're going to talk about um, Casey's uh, fiction that she writes. So, Casey, where um, can we find these books that you're starting to write? Do you have a website, correct? Yes. Um, CaseyBizet.com is my author website. And I have written, I have four completed, fully completed books that I would say. I have one that's completed, but it's still in revisions. Um, So there's like a little, or not excerpt, but there's like a little summary of of each of the completed books on that website. Um, but they are not published yet, so I'm, I'm seeking an agent, a literary agent for them. Um, so, um, you know, right now it's just if somebody wants to kind of see the summary just for fun. But um, I hope to – I'm hoping – that's kind of my goal this year is to get a literary agent. So I feel like I'm, I'm on my way, but it's just – it's a very long and difficult process mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. What prompted you – the first thing. <laughs> what, I'm sorry. Pro- what prompted you to uh, start writing – uh, it's not children's books. They're like preteen or teenager books, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, since I was a teacher, um, I taught middle school. I taught sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, and I, I taught science and then I taught English. But um, I've always loved to read. I've always loved books. And um, really, even as an adult, I still read mostly young adult books just because um, mm-hmm. that's just, I don't know, I just yeah. enjoy them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, They're good. Yeah, they are. They so are. a lot of them really have like a wide like crossover appeal, yeah. like to, to adults. So, um, so yeah, that's what I like to read, and that's what you know my students when I was teaching like to read. And I just that kind of I just have kind of a natural like voice for it, I guess. Whenever mm-hmm. I, I write, it just naturally fits into that category. So um, nice. So yeah, that's that's what I write about. So or that's the audience I write for. Nice. Yeah. Could you give us a brief summary of the first book that would that you wrote? Um, it's equestrian related, correct? It is, yes. The first three books are um, very much based on horses. So the first book, um, which took me like three years to complete, it was really just it was hard <laughs> to Aww. get through that first book, um, and it's probably my most creative, I guess, because it's it's like a science fiction and it's about uh, it's really set like in this futuristic time where this girl is a time traveler hmm. but in her world um uh, everybody's different basically like um, animals are all wild um 
she sees horses, but she you can't touch them because they're so wild and so fast that you just can't even get near them. But she's always just like really admired them, and she um, has the opportunity to travel back in time to the time when people rode horses and mm. you know had horses. Nice. So, um, so it's also a romance because she travels back in time and she happens to meet this boy who has horses and they kind of fall in love <laughs> and it's um it's a love story but it's also about her you know really falling in love with horses as well and getting to actually be around them so um nice yeah that's my first one and that's my only science fiction one really so the others are more contemporary so they're set like in you know our regular world so cool nice all right well thank you for taking time out of your day to record with us we really enjoyed having you mm -hmm. um we hope you enjoyed listening to our podcast and encourage you to share with all your equestrian family and friends. You can tune into the Late Night Riders podcast show every Friday night. Each episode will be uploaded exclusively on YouTube where you can subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with all of our latest shows. Do you have a topic you'd like to discuss? We want to hear from you. You may email us at podcast at rampance.com or feel free to leave a comment below. Thank you again for listening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm sorry.